As we begin this second session, we're going to read Ruth chapter 2. If you haven't read the whole of Ruth lately, feel free time soon uh, to fill in the gaps. But this is Ruth chapter 2. And what we're saying will cover not only this chapter, but the next two as well. There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth, of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. So Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain, after him in whose sight I might find favour. And he said to her, Go, my daughter. She said to her, Go, my daughter. Then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. She happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge, Whose young woman is this? So the servant, who was in charge of the reapers, answered and said, It is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she continued from morning until now, though she rested a little while in the house. Then Boaz said to Ruth, You will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here but stay close by my young women. Let your eyes feel which they reap, and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favour in your eyes, that you should take notice of me, since I am a foreigner? And Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you have left your land of your birth and have come to a people whom you did not know before. The Lord repay your work and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. Then she said, Let me find favour in your sight, my Lord, For you have comforted me and have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am one of your maidservants. Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, Come here and eat bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed parched grain to her and she sat and was satisfied and kept some back. And when she arose up, Boaz commanded his young men saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves. And do not reproach her. Also let grain from the bundles fall purposely for her. Leave it that she may glean, and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening, and beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about a barley. Then she took it and went into the city, and her mother-in-law saw that she had gleaned. So she brought out and gave to her what she had kept back after she had been satisfied. And her mother-in-law said to her, Where have you gleaned today? And where did you work? Blessed who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be the Lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. And Naomi said to her, This man is a relative of ours, one of our close relatives. Ruth the Moabitess said, He also said to me, You shall stay close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young men and that people do not meet you in any other field. So she stayed close by the young women of Boaz to glean until the end of the barley harvest and wheat harvest. And she dwelt with her mother-in-law. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to that reading from his word. Let's pray. 
Father we thank you for the word of God which brings understanding to us brings salvation to us Lord builds us up and helps us day by day we thank you Lord for that word which is a lamp to our feet to our path Lord we also thank you that you are the God of the word and we come to you acknowledging Lord that sometimes we struggle spiritually sometimes even uh, your word can seem dull or hard for us and we pray that you would come to us and help us we thank you Lord that you are indwelt by your spirit and we pray that the spirit of God would help us to not only understand but also see the implications of these things in the life of Ruth for us Father we thank you that you put together uh, these 66 books of scripture you breathe them out as it were be Lord a living testimony and a, and a foundation for your church in every generation Lord help us as we look at this part of it to handle rightly your word of truth and help our souls Lord to be built up and refreshed through your word we ask this in Jesus name Amen well we're looking now under this theme of a heart of devotion amidst life's changes we focused on change in the first session now we're directing our attention to this theme of devotion we've seen that the change that took place in the life of Naomi and Ruth were big changes small changes some very negative and what they would have described as bad others very positive which they would have thanked the Lord for and through these changes God was doing something in their lives that this book of Ruth is like a ray of sunshine uh, bursting into the midst of the dark days of the judges uh, here is an island of sanity in a world that seemed to have gone mad here is an island of biblical faithfulness in very godless confusing and selfish why was there in this book this place of sanity and godliness in the midst of a very difficult situation well the answer ultimately is that the Lord is a God of steadfast love uh, the Lord came to this woman to these women uh, to this man this family and poured out his love and grace upon them he provided for them and it reminds us of what's said in Lamentations chapter 3 that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases his mercies never come to an end they're new every morning great is his faithfulness so that why God was so good to this family goes back to God his sovereign purposes and his great grace but what God did in the life of this woman Ruth was to save her was to work within her a real heart of devotion to God and his way now before we proceed I've got to at least give some definition of a heart of devotion I don't mean and I trust that it wasn't meant in the giving of this title by the phrase a heart of devotion I don't mean that Ruth was on a perpetual emotional high I'm sure in fact that she wasn't I'm sure she wept when her husband died I'm sure she faced many difficulties in a very real life situation over the years that followed it wasn't that Ruth was somehow glazed eyed and perpetually rejoicing no matter what was happening around it wasn't her emotions that were up it was the grace of God to her nor was it that Ruth had the privileged opportunity because she didn't of spending the whole of her life sitting down with the open law of God in front of her and reading that law every day and praying to the day and cultivating her in secret life of devotion to God we've just read Ruth chapter 2 and there we find Ruth a woman of devotion in the midst of very long days over those two harvest periods which was probably estimated as a four month time and here she is in every day apart from the Sabbath and working from early in that day to the end of the day in the very laborious task of gleaning in those fields so the reapers were going through taking up the harvest and she was going along picking up what was left sorting out what was good in order to meet for herself 
and for her mother-in-law. So it wasn't that her life was given over to a, an ideal life of 100% prayer and Bible reading, prayer and Bible reading, communion with God in that way. Hers was a life of devotion lived in a very difficult circumstance from chapter 2. What we do mean by a heart of devotion that in Ruth we find a keen awareness of God and, and an acknowledgement of God as the true and living God. And in that acknowledgement and in that awareness there becomes the cotton of real fellowship with him. In other words, here is a woman who came from a very difficult background who was saved by God, brought into the midst of the people of God and then cultivated a living and close relationship with the living God such that she was determined to obey God and live life his way. That was hard for an Israelite woman but this was a Moabitess and it's emphasised uh, through chapter 2. This is Ruth the Moabitess and that's how she was known. She was a foreigner, she was a stranger, she was from somewhere else and now she's in the midst of the land of Israel, in her is this growing life of devotion to God expressed in many practical ways. We aren't given a chapter 5 showing Ruth's law reading or prayer life. We're given chapters 1 through to 4 showing the practical outcome of a life of devotion. Now, obvious, so please excuse me, but none of us are in charge of our circumstances, are we? Uh, none of you probably planned out on the day that you were converted what your Christian life would look like. And if you were foolish enough to imagine what it would look like, it's probably in most cases very different to what you thought it would be. We're not in charge of our circumstances. We're not pulling the strings. We're not, we're not manipulating things. God is the one who's in control of all things and he is the Lord over our lives. So whether your life is unfolding as you thought it might or whether your life's unravelling in ways you never thought possible, God is sovereign over those things and he is the one in charge of the changes. So it's not your responsibility to try and prevent changes from happening and to live in an isolated little cocoon or a stained glass foxhole uh, where you're prevented from just ever reaching through to me because I don't like them. It's not your part or my part to engineer our circumstances and pull the strings to, do, to try and get our end. But what we are responsible for under God is the way we respond to those circumstances that he is in front of us. The way that we react uh, to the things that he has put in our path. As somebody, and I think it was one of the Puritans originally memorably said, we can't stop the birds flying over our head but we can stop them making nests in our hair. Uh, that's our responsibility. Uh, the birds will fly over our heads, we can't stop, but we can make a decent effort stopping them making a nest in our hair. We have human responsibility. Now some of us have been, or maybe even are, crippled by changes and circumstances. We feel paralysed, uh, we feel like that animal caught in the car headlights we do, things are happening that we didn't want to turn out the way that they are. In the midst of that, what's crucial, because we can't alter the circumstances or many of them, what's crucial for us is the way that we respond. Are we going to respond in a godly way which reflects the reality that we really love God with all our heart, mind and strength and we love our neighbours as ourselves or whether that's just words for us? That this is the rubber hitting the road in the life of Ruth and this is what the life of real devotion looks like in her circumstances. What we're going to do for the remainder of this session is just to point out some of that impacted and shaped Ruth's life of devotion. Now some of these are inferences from the text because we're not given a New Testament description of these things. These are worked out very much in Old Covenant language some of the things seem strange to us, the barley harvest and the, the laws of Israel. Some of the things in chapter 3 we say what's going on there as Ruth lays down at the end of, at the feet of the sleeping Boaz. You know, is this immorality? What's happening here? Is this the social custom of the day? There's some things here which we think, well, what's happening? But what I'm trying to draw out is the abiding lesson of these things 
and we'll at least answer some of these things as we move through. So we're saying what makes a difference? The changes will come, but what makes a difference between person A who is pushed over and pushed around by every change, no matter how small, and person B, and kind of person, who everything seems to have gone wrong in their life and yet they're still standing. And not only are they still standing, but they're still loving God and they're still serving God and they're still interested in other people more than themselves. And so what makes that person tick? Well, it's the grace of God. There's also the God that's been cultivated in a life of real fellowship with him. And it's made those differences. Uh, John Bunyan in his Pilgrim's Progress uh, takes Christian into Interpreter's House and they, they see a fire burning against a wall and that fire keeps on going and somebody is throwing water consistently on the fire but the fire is never going out and Christian can't work out what's going, going on here. The fire's there but water's being doused on it. It should be out by now but it keeps on going. Why is it still burning? Why isn't it dead? And then interpreter takes Christian around to the other wall and there's somebody pouring in oil consistently on the fire. And because they've got that supply of oil feeding the fire, it's never going to go out. Well, that's what some people's lives, by the grace of God, I know them, and probably many of you know them. People have been pouring water on their lives for decades, trying to put them out, and their circumstances have gone upside down and pear-shaped, and yet they're still loving God, and people can't see it. And they can't see it because they don't know the secret source behind the wall, which is the living God who has saved them and is nurturing them and helping them and protecting them and sustaining them and will do so until the end. What makes the difference? Well, let's highlight a few things that make a difference. Have a look at Ruth chapter 2 from verse 15, please. Oh, sorry, Ruth chapter 1 verse 15 first. Here is the time where there could have very, very easily been no book of Ruth. Naomi's made the momentous decision that she's going to go back to her, to her homeland, back to Bethlehem in Judah. That's what she has decided to do. Both her daughters-in-law show admirable degree of support for their mother-in-law and they say, we're going to go with you. Orpah says that, Ruth says that, they're supporting her. In verse 8 of chapter 1 she expresses to them, The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. Orpah had been faithful to her as well. Ruth had been faithful. They both shown kindness to her, they supported her. When their husbands died they hadn't just left her for dead and gone back to their families in comfortable situations. They supported this woman in a strange land in great difficulty, bereft of husband and sons. They'd shown kindness. And now they're getting back. And Naomi gives them the opportunity to stay. She expresses kindness for them, but she says, uh, verse 10, or they say to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi says, Turn back, my daughters. Why would you me? Are there still sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight, and should also bear sons, would you wait for them until they were grown? Would you restrain from having husbands? Naomi's saying, look, this is a dead end if you come with me. Coming with me is like the full stop of all your hopes. It's very unlikely if you stick with me that you'll have a husband. It's very unlikely if you stick with me that you'll have children. This is going to be the end. I mean, she felt that against her, she felt that God's hand was against her, and even to go back with her seemed to be a dead end for her daughters-in-law, and out of at least love on that level, she says, no, stay, stay here, find husbands among your own people. And she tries to prevail upon them. In verse 14, both women, Ruth, Rorpa, lift up their voices, they weep. Orpa kisses her mother-in-law, but Ruth is clinging on to her. She's holding on to her and won't let go. And Orpa takes the counsel, as it were, of Naomi and goes back to her people, back to her family home, and she's going to stay there in Moab. But Ruth is different. 
she's clinging on. Why is she clinging on? Why doesn't she take what seems like sound advice? Prospect of a husband, prospect of being in her own homeland, being around her relatives and friends. Why doesn't she say, great, I've got a let out here. And in verse 15, we read, Naomi, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. And of course, there's this memorable statement of Ruth's, sometimes used in marriage ceremonies either, even, but here is a memorable statement of, of commitment. Ruth says, in not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Why is Ruth so determined? Why is she clinging to Naomi? Is it human love for her mother-in-law? No doubt God had put a real love for Naomi in Ruth's, heart, in Ruth's heart. She wanted Naomi's best. She wanted to help her. She wanted to protect her. She wanted to support her. She felt some responsibility at that level. But that's not all, because look what Ruth goes on to say. Wherever you lodge, lodge. your people shall be my people. Now that, that seems okay for us in the 21st century where people move internationally and where people move from different cultural backgrounds and we're familiar with those kind of transitions but for a Moabite to say your people shall be my people and then to say your God my God was decisive that wasn't just said off the top of Ruth's head this was a conclusion that she was being driven to by the grace of God because in, in those days everything linked together. If you're in the land of Moab, you worship Chemosh. If you're in the land of Israel, you worship the Lord God of Israel. And the lands and the peoples and their gods were closely intertwined. So she's not just saying this off the top of her head. There is love for her mother-in-law here, but there's something more here as well. There's a growing understanding of who God is, not only to the person of Naomi, but to Naomi's people, the people of Israel, and to Naomi's God, the Lord God, the living and true God. She goes on to say that this is not a momentary thing, verse 17, where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. Lord, the Lord, not Chemosh, the Lord, do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. Now that's a statement of incredible commitment at a human level, one human being to another, but it's more than that, isn't it? There is entwined in that a groaning conviction that the Lord had somehow been working in this woman's heart where she came to acknowledge that the Lord God of Israel, He is the living and true God, and I'm prepared to forsake not only my people and my family, but my gods and go and join myself into this land where I've never been, rest of my life under that God, under his kingship. And she says, using the name of the Lord, the Lord do so to me and more also. She's doing this before God. I'm going to come and may the Lord, if I'm not true to my word, may the Lord judge me. May the Lord deal if I'm not faithful to what I've said. So it's not expressed in New Testament terminology but it's expressed in this outworking in this Old Testament situation that the Lord through that unusual means of sending his reluctant and unknowing missionary Elimelech and Naomi and Marlon and Chilion into, Mo into Moab where the law of God said don't go there and certainly don't allow your children to intermarry with those children and said they're not to be part of the people of God. God sent them with all sorts of differing reasons about preserving their family into that land, partly in order to rescue this one Moabite woman and draw her into a living relationship with God. Now there are testimonies, but that's quite a testimony, isn't it? That God sent through this means, they weren't going there for missionary purposes, they weren't, weren't establishing the United Moab mission or anything, they were going there to feed their family and in some ways they were fleeing from God's purposes for them but the Lord was sovereign the Lord was king over all those mixed motives and even wrong decision making and the Lord used that to pluck this woman out of the middle of a pagan nation 
and establish her in Israel. We saw at the end of the last session, make a part of the line of David, great grandmother to the man who was the man after God's own heart, the sweet psalmist, the sweet singer of Israel, and then make her part of the family line through which the Lord Jesus Christ would come. That's incredible grace to her. And that, that wonderful account of the genealogy of Christ in Matthew chapter 1. And who do you have there? You've got Ruth. And all, before that you've got Boaz. And you've got Boaz, the son of Rahab. Interesting lineage here. A woman plucked out of a Canaanite situation, a pagan situation, incorporated into the family of God, into the people of God there. This is the grace of God. But what makes the ultimate difference in why Ruth responds so well to these changes so far, is that she is a saved woman. And that's expressed in chapter 2, verse 12, in a very graphic way. Boaz is talking uh, to Ruth in this first encounter with her after she's been gleaning in his fields. Shows a lot of kindness. And then Boaz says this, Ruth 2 and verse 12, The Lord repay your work and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for, come for refuge. May the Lord repay your work, Ruth, your faithfulness to your mother-in-law, your hard work in these fields to support her. May the Lord repay your work and may a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. Salvation is the thing that makes the difference. Some people who aren't Christians respond to change very well. Some people who aren't Christians even respond to negative circumstances and they seem to have a stiff upper lip and they'll, they'll gather up all their human resources and they'll make it through the change, sometimes even make it change with a smile on their face. But what makes a real difference to responding to these changes in not only an outwardly okay way but in a way that really pleases God is salvation is salvation and Ruth as a woman who'd come under the wings of Israel who'd taken refuge in that God who trusted herself in that God even when she was 50 miles away in a pagan land she was now his and God was the one who was shaping and moulding her life and making a difference in the way that she responded so ultimately when the next however long we've got in, in saying here are practical ways you can respond to change. But those ways will make no difference whatsoever. They might make a surface difference, but no substantial difference whatsoever unless you know the living God, unless you've cut a relationship with him. You can only honour God in those changes by being one who knows and loves and is savingly joined to him. Because that relationship with him makes a difference to everything. In the New Testament, Second Corinthians chapter chapter four. Sorry, second chapter five. Just turn with me there for a moment. It shows how salvation impacts everything. In two Corinthians five from verse fourteen, Paul says for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves but for him who died for them and rose again. Therefore, on we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The starting point for a heart of devotion in the midst of life's changes is to come to know the God of all life, the living and true God. Here it's described in 2 Corinthians 5.17 
as a new creation. Coming to God, coming to know Christ in truth is becoming a new creation. The old has passed away, behold the new has come. In 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6 it's described as similar to the work of creation where once there was nothing and God spoke into being all things by his word of power similarly of creation where there is no spiritual life when we're dead in trespasses and sins God speaks, God works by his spirit and life comes where there was formerly no life as the light shone out of darkness physically so the light of Christ shines spiritually on our souls and brings us to life and therefore everything changes. There in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says, Now we regard no one from a human point of view. Our way of looking at people has changed. He said we used to look at Christ from a human point of view. From his point of view as a Pharisee of the Pharisees, he hated the Christ. He opposed the name of Christ. He took people into prison and made them blaspheme the name of Christ. But then Christ met him on the road to Damascus saved him and changed everything. He no longer viewed Christ as a usurper, Christ as a heretic, a false teacher. He viewed Christ as his, his God. And he said, my way of viewing all other people has changed as well. I'm in Christ. I no longer regard people from a human point of view. Now what mattered to you before you were a Christian about other people? What was, what was significant to you before you were a Christian about others? probably evaluated them in your sin uh, by did they, do they like me? <laughs> if they like me I'll like them or are they interested in similar things to me? If so I'll cultivate a fellowship, a friendship with them. If not I won't bother with them or maybe we even thought more sinfully I can use them. If I get to know them I'll have influence here, I'll have a situation open for me here. We regard the people from a human point of view. But then Christ came and decisively changed us and now we no longer regard other people from a human point of view. What's the most important thing to you as you meet a stranger, someone you've met before? Well, if you're a Christian, I would beg to suggest that the most important thing to you is, is this person I'm meeting for the first time a Christian? Do they know Christ? Do they know the living God? If they do, you want to cultivate Christian friendship with them. You want to help them on their way to heaven. You want to benefit one another. Actually, if they're not a Christian, then what kicks in is a compassionate concern for their salvation. You can be friends at many levels, but what you're most concerned about and what you would love for most for them is that they come to know the living God that you yourself know and come to be saved and experience the benefit of being in Christ. So everything is coloured, everything is changed by being saved. Similarly here in Ruth, her perspective was no longer a Chemosh perspective or a Moabite perspective. It was the perspective of a woman who knew the living God and had come to Tehuge under the wings of the living God as it pictures it there in chapter 2 and verse 12. So, if you are not saved... Uh, my advice could go over the top of your head it would be basically useless because the crucial thing in facing the changes of life is to have that anchor within the veil, that genuine true knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ to have turned your back on sin, repentance and come to trust in the living God by faith. So that's the platform. And that's why Ruth behaves as she does it's because God's done a work in her soul and brought life there with previous death. But the second thing here that impacts the way that she's operating in these chapters and that's her theology. Well, I'm using theology here tightly not just to refer to general Christian belief but what Ruth came to believe about God. If you take nothing else away from this session take this that what matters most in your responses to the changes that take place in your life, in your attitude to your circumstances, what matters most is your view of God. Who you believe him to be, who you know him to be is the natural thing. Uh, there's a view circulating in evangelical theological circles in the United States particularly called open theism or free will theism. And it's a view even taken up by some evangelical theologians 
that God really doesn't know what's going to happen. He's not omniscient. He doesn't really know what's going to happen, but in a sense God is somewhat like us in that he's, he loves his people, he wants to do them good, but he doesn't really know what's going to happen next. He may know the general outline, he may know the end, but he's not in charge of the circumstances, he's not working in all things for good. They wouldn't use that verse, they would put a different meaning in there. But they're saying God's a hands-off God who is surprised by some of the things that happen to you and to me. Now that's not the God of Scripture. God knows all things. God is working in all things for the good of his people who love him, who are called according to his purpose. God is sending all these things in his providence and drawing them and driving them towards his good and appointed end, the summing up of all things in Christ. That's the God that we believe in. And, and Ruth is strong in the midst of life's changes because she's got a hold of, she doesn't have a theological degree, she hasn't been up uh, in Israel being schooled by her parents or at the local synagogue or whatever in, in the truth of, of God. But she's come to see and come to believe and now it's being nurtured, her understanding of who God is and that's what's making the difference. Again, chapter 2 and verse 12. Who does she understand the Lord to be? In Boaz's words, He's the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Or in terms of chapter 2 and verse 19, Naomi says to her at the end of that first day of work in the fields, Where have you gleaned today? Where did you work? Blessed be the one who took notice of you. That's Boaz. Blessed be the one who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, That man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. Verse 20, Naomi said to her-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. This is the God that Ruth is clinging to spiritually. This is the God who is in sovereign control of all things. She's sheltered and taken refuge under him. She's been incorporated into the, his people and the Lord is sovereign. The Lord knew that day what field Ruth would go into. She wandered into the field, took this one, didn't know whose field it was. It turned out to be the field of her future husband. It turned out to be the field of Boaz who was a close relative of a Naomi's husband. She didn't know all these things. She was just going out, finding a field with a the, with the focused purpose, with the blinkers on. I've got to feed myself. I've got to feed Naomi. And she went into the field. But Naomi gets it. She says, Blessed be the one who took notice of you. The, the Lord's sovereign in these things. Then also, Blessed be he of the Lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. So the Lord put her in that field on that day and the Lord put her in the right field that would lead to a series of events that would lead to marriage that would lead to and that she would be blessed beyond what she could ever have imagined. The Moabites in the midst of the people of God yet coming to an honoured and privileged position there. And Ruth's the theology is growing. Ruth knows she can trust God. She's going out confident that God will lead and she's being instructed here by Naomi that God is kind, that God is a God of all grace. In the midst of the wilderness in Genesis, Hagar had a hard time and fled into the wilderness with her young son Ishmael and she thought that was it. She thought they were going to start wilderness and in the midst of that situation the Lord revealed herself, himself to her, protected her, protected her son spoke of something about his purposes even for their family through the generations and Hagar got it because she said the Lord is the one who sees. The Lord is the one who sees. Nobody else was taking notice of Hagar but the Lord knew exactly where she was, saw exactly where she was, met her exactly where she was and encouraged her and helped her and provided for her. Same here with Ruth. The Lord was the one who took notice of her. Yes, Boaz took notice of was kind to her but Boaz was really an instrument in the hands of a good and sovereign God who was determined to do good to his child Ruth and to have wonderful purposes for the outworking of her life. 
someone commented on Ruth with this phrase hands of a changeless God I fear no change in the hands of a changeless God I fear no change is that you today? no matter what changes may be impacting your life do you realise from the scriptures that you are his child and therefore you are in the hands of a changeless God Uh, Malachi 3.6 for I the Lord do not change therefore you O sons of Jacob are not consumed your life isn't going to end you're not going to be eaten up there's not going to be a finish there's going to be devastation I the Lord deigns therefore you O sons of Jacob will not be consumed or in the New Testament Jesus Christ the same yesterday today and forever that's the God that we worship worship he doesn't change he doesn't alter he's always the same never alters from his omnipotence he has all power never alters from his love he has set it upon his people he will always set it upon his people and will not remove it in fact no one can rip us out of his hand as the Lord Jesus says in John chapter 10 the most important thing in our response to change is who God is so the best thing that you can do if you want to build yourself up as a woman of devotion to handle the changes of life is to cultivate your theology cultivate your view of God build up your understanding of who God is we'll talk about our fellowship with him in the moment level sometimes Christians in this generation are pathetically weak they don't read their Bibles or they read their Bibles rarely sometimes sadly people are in situations where they're not having the word of God faithfully ministered to them I feel for people in that situation it's difficult what to do well one of the things to do is to cultivate your understanding of who God is now read the scriptures and and read scriptures like this let me walk you through a few scriptures at this point Psalm 17 who is God? We're just pursuing one main law a moment. Who is God? Psalm 17, verses 7 to 9. This is the infallible word of God, giving us an accurate picture of what our God is really like. Here is David. He's praying. Psalm 17, verses 7 to 9. Show your loving kindness by your right hand. O you who save those who trust in you, from those who rise up against them. That's our God. He's the God who saves those who trust in him from those up who rise against them. When people rise up against you and oppose you, the Lord is the one who says, who trust in him. Verse 8, Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me again under the shadow of your wings from the wicked who oppress me, from my deadly enemies who surround me deadly enemies who surround me now I don't know whether any of you are in a situation where you're by deadly enemies but even if you are you are protected by the Lord you can trust in him you need to cultivate your understanding of how great he is and how great his love for you is Psalm 36 verses 7 and 8 these are just little walk through aspects of God's character particularly as he protects his people and shelters them Psalm 36 7 and 8 how precious is your loving kindness O Lord therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house and you give them to drink from the river of your pleasures for with you is the fountain of life in your light we see light now do you really believe that about the Lord have you really come to that understanding of who he is not just ticking off the confession of faith Uh, we could parrot out the statements in the Westminster confession of faith or the Baptist confession of faith all these things about who God is but each of those statements are powerful summaries of scripture and they're something true about our God and he is the God who we can take refuge under the shelter of his wings Psalm 63 a couple of more passages on this Psalm 63 verses 7 and 8 
Who is our God? Can we trust him in the mind? David again, writing this psalm when he was in the wilderness of Judah, verses 7 and 8. Because you have been my help, therefore in the shadow of your wings I will rejoice. My soul follows close behind you, right hand upholds me. He's writing the psalm in the midst of the wilderness. He's being pursued often by, by the previous king Saul. His life's hanging by a thread. But he says, when I remember you on my bed, when I meditate on you in my night watches, you have help in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. Your, my soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. That's good theology and good practice as well. The cultivation of a right understanding of the Lord. Psalm 91, just to find in, these, in this brief survey of who God is, emphasising the shadow of his wings. Psalm 91 from verse 1. Here is the prayer of Moses kept for us in the Psalms. Lord, you have been our dwelling place generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn man to destruction and say, Return, O children of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday last, and like a watch in the night. You carry them away like a flood. They're like a sleep. In the morning they are like grass which grows up. In the morning it flourishes and grows up. In the evening it's cut down and withers. For we have been consumed by your anger. By your wrath we are terrified. Imagine being Moses, you know, leading that bunch of whining complainers, millions of them, uh, through the wilderness. They had the chance to go into the promised land, but through disobedience and a lack of faith and trust in their God, they were turned back and for 40 years that nation moaned their way around the wilderness as God miraculously provided for them. Moses had to deal with that. And he says here in verse 8, You have set our... Sorry, not verse 8. I read Psalm 90, didn't I? I should have read Psalm 91, excuse me. It's very relevant as well. The Psalm 91. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him I will trust. He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler, from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Your ter you shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. Again, a graphic picture. Here is the person blessed of the Lord, knowing the Lord, taking refuge in the Lord. Thousands are falling at that site, ten thousand are falling at the right hand. But here is a protected person who knows and loves the Lord and is kept by him. Most important thing in the midst of change, particularly change we would view as negative, is that understanding of who God is. So read the scriptures, read the Psalms, take time. Sometimes under pressure we minimise prayer, we minimise our time in the scriptures, we maximise time worrying and thinking about what's going wrong. Turn to God. Trust in Him. It's that understanding of who He is. In the hand of a changeless God, I fear no change. What makes the difference? What made the difference for Ruth? It was salvation and it was also her theology, her right view of God. 
as one in whom she, even as a stranger, could take refuge. Thirdly here, one thing that made a real difference in Ruth's life was Naomi. What, one thing that made a real, life, a real difference in Naomi's life was Ruth. Can you imagine the book of Ruth without Naomi? She struggled. She struggled at times with bitterness, but she took her pagan daughter-in-law back to the land of promise. She gave her wise, practical counsel. She had been kind to her and Ruth had been kind to Naomi. There was wonderful fellowship and support in that situation. That's the thing to have, isn't it? That's a wonderful thing to have in the midst of change. It's fellowship and support of people who know God and who know you. If you've got that wonderful combination working somewhere in your life, in your church, in your family, with your friends, those who know God and also know you, that's a blessing and a support in the midst of change. If you don't have that, that's what churches are supposed to be about. <laughs> We're supposed to be places where we stir up one another to love and good works, not just stir up one another, but we stir up and encourage one another to love and good works, where we call real relationships of faith and fellowship with the people of God. In one of the other smaller books of Scripture, the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 4, we read this in verse 9. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labour. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. I don't know the great majority of you here today, but I would ask you the Syrian, do you have a friend like that? Do you have friends like that? If you do, rejoice and give thanks to God daily. If you don't, pray to the Lord that he would give you friends who know you and who know him, who will do according to Proverbs 27.6, for the wounds of a friend, profuse are the kisses of an enemy, who won't smother you in lovely words and be afraid of telling you the truth. We need friends who know God and who trust God and take their heart in their mouth and are willing to speak straight to me or straight to you about where things are at spiritually. Earlier this week I sat down with a man who's been coming along to our church in Christchurch. Um, I had something to ask him about which uh, nobody really knew the true story about. He'd been coming along to the church for about three months and uh, he had a relationship. It was partner somewhere in the background. Nobody knew whether the partner was his wife, uh, his de facto, a good friend. Uh, it was a bit of a mystery to us. So I asked some of the other men in the fellowship, have any of you spoken to them about where this man is at and where this relationship is at? Because he's coming around our fellow regularly and I don't want people interacting with them as if they're husband and wife, if they're not husband and wife. And uh, they said, no, we don't really know where they're at. So I thought, well, I'll take this man out for lunch and we will have a conversation and gulp. I will talk to him about who, what his relationship with this woman is. And uh, I procrastinated. <laughs> the conversation drifted on to many useful things, but I knew at the back of my mind I had to see for his soul's sake because he was saying to me, I was a Christian, I was in the New Zealand army, I was converted as a young man, I'm now 47, I've from the Lord for 18 years and in the course of those 18 years where I haven't gone regularly to church I've cultivated this relationship with this woman and I knew I had to ask him about it for his soul's good. If this was not his wife I needed to know that and I needed to give him some biblical counsel in the light of that and by the grace of God the conversation opened up and by the grace of God at the end of that conversation he quoted Proverbs 27 6 to me and said Faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuses, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Thank you for honestly talking about this with me. He said, I've gone to Christian friends, what about my relationship? And they were too embarrassed to talk to me about it. He said, thank you for being honest enough to ask me a question about this relationship. And so I'm really keen to 
and he explained what it was, which is not necessary for you to know, but I'm really keen to get this sorted out. And I'd quoted to him immediately before that, Psalm 66, 18, We cherish iniquity. If we love sin in our hearts, the Lord will not listen. Because he's saying there's blockages in my relationship with God. And I said, maybe there's a blockage in terms of your relationship with this woman that you need to sort out biblically. So cultivate relationships where people know God, word, know you, and will have the inverted commas, excuse me for a women's meeting, guts, uh, to speak honestly and openly to you about where you're at. If you are not in a fellowship where that's happening, seek out a fellowship, seek out women in your fellowship where that is actually happening and where there can be, some of you have that, that's wonderful, some of you are not in those circumstances. Fellowship is crucial in handling the changes that come to us in life. A good friend is worth more than the world. And it was crucially so for Ruth, and it was crucially so for Naomi and her struggles at this time as well. One more thing. In responding to change with a heart of devotion, what we see in Ruth's life was a persevering faith. She was a fairly new believer, as it were, in a very different circumstance. But we see glimpses of real quality in life. She was taking God seriously and she was taking the Word of God seriously. Let me give you a few examples. Even back there in Ruth chapter 1 verse 8, Naomi is trying to persuade her daughters-in-law, don't come with me, it's going to be difficult. She says to both of them, Ruth includes, the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. She's saying, Ruth, Orpah, In your lives, you were faithful to your husbands. They have died, and since their deaths, you have been faithful to me. You have supported me over this very difficult... Don't think of me now. She was saying, think of yourselves, because following me could be very difficult and could result in you never marrying, never having children. But the quality of Ruth's life begins to shine out even there. Or chapter 2 and verse 7. Boaz is finding out about Ruth being in this situation. And Ruth says, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. This is verse 7, first of all, then verse 8. She, ca- sorry, she, so she came and has continued from morning until now, though she rested a little in the house. Then Boaz to Ruth, You will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not glean in another field nor go from here, but stay close by my young woman. Here is a a woman of faith in difficult circumstances, but she's determined to support herself, support her mother-in-law. She's in the field. The testimony of the other workers, the boss is. She's working really hard. She's only taken a very legitimate break for rest, but she's been at at it all day. And what's seen here is is a, a real work of God in grace. And Boaz is impressed, but as he responds and says, In my fields from now on, I've commanded my young men not to touch you. I've commanded the women to also provide for you and leave some provision for you in the fields. And in Ruth 2 and verse 10, she falls on her face, bows down to the ground and says, Why, why have I found favour in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I'm a foreigner. See, Ruth knows God and loves God, but she's still humble. She doesn't think that she's made it. She's not boasting of what she has done for her mother-in-law. She's amazed and overwhelmed at the grace of God. This man should be kind to her. She falls on the ground. She falls face down to the earth. Why have I found favour in her eyes that you should take notice of me? I'm a foreigner, remember? I'm a Moabite. (laughs) You shouldn't be showing this sort of kindness to me. And then how does Boaz respond? It has been reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you have left your father and your mother in the land of your birth and have come to a people whom you did not know before. So here is a, a real rubber hits the road, persevering faith in Ruth's life. Even at this early stage, it had been fully reported to Boaz just what quality of woman this woman was. She left everything behind. 
she'd selflessly, tirelessly given herself to providing for her mother-in-law. And that had been reported. And among Israel, and in that place of Bethlehem, some healthy rumours were going out, there's a woman here. She's come from Moab. And she's selflessly loving her mother-in-law. And she's even going out to provide for herself and her mother-in-law. She's shown kindness to, to her Israelite husband. She's shown kindness to her Israelite uh, mother-in-law. What column is here? One of the early Roman emperors uh, having confrontation with the early church. I think it was the Emperor Julian the Apostate uh, said in response to one of the early Christian writers, what women you Christian have, <laughs> you Christians have. He said, what women you Christians have. What had impressed that emperor was the quality of Christian women. So they're not like the pagan women, they're different. They love God and of course one of the habits in that early church they would find infant children left out and exposed and left to die by their pagan uh, parents because boys <laughs> and uh, the Christian women and their husbands would go take those women, take them into their household and raise them as their own children. And the quality of love and grace in the lives of those women even shook one of the pagan emperors. But that's what's happening here in Ruth. The quality of persevering this faith-driven worker that Ruth was was coming uh, to the fore and she was humble alongside it. Ruth chapter 3 as we draw to a close. Ruth 3 verses 5 and 6. This is her response to her mother-in-law giving her some instructions about how she should go and how she should present herself to Boaz in order that he might take up the family responsibilities that were there in Israel for those who had lost husbands. But she's given this advice which was strange to her, not the customs of her people. And she says to her mother-in-law in verse 5, All that you say to me, I will do. So she goes to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law had instructed her, even what would have seemed strange to her, lying down at the feet of this man Boaz, which was in the context not an immoral act or a seductive act, but was part of the custom times, lay down at his feet, so that when he woke up in the middle of the night and recognised her there, realised that here was a woman wanting him to take up his responsibilities as a kinsman redeemer, and he, she was in that situation. She was not an immoral woman, she was a woman of faith, carefully following instructions of this foreign custom. Or then in chapter 3 and verse 11, And now my daughter, says Naomi, and now my daughter, do not fear, I will do to you, I will do for you all that you request. I'm sorry, this is Boaz here. And now my daughter, do not fear, I will do for that you request. For all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. What a quality person Ruth was. All the people of my town in this short space of time know that you are a, a virtuous woman or a woman of faith, a faithful woman. And then chapter and verse 15, we've mentioned it already. The women are speaking to Naomi. Now Ruth is married. Now Ruth has a child. They say to Naomi, Now may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you is better to you than seven sons. You see the quality that God worked in the life of this woman? She wasn't offered Bible conventions. She wasn't doing any of those spiritual things. She was working hard in the field. She was loving her mother-in-law. She was showing her faith in real and practical ways. And she persevered. She was staying to course. How to respond to change when everything seems to blow up and everything's upside down? How to respond to change is to be a woman like Ruth who knew her God who lived by grace and who worked out her faith in the most practical ways. And in that way, in a very short space of time, built up an incredible testimony among the Israelite woman who would have been excused for being very critical of who she was, who's this foreigner, said that this is a woman who loves you and she's better to you, Naomi, than seven sons. 
You could have Marlon, Chilean and five more and this woman has proved more value to you, more good to you, a greater blessing to you than seven sons. Can we close by looking at Psalm 46? Read out these opening three verses to you. Psalm 46 expresses where you need to be, where I need to be in the midst of days of change, where we can often be swept off our feet. Psalm 40 is prefaced in the scriptures by a song for Alamoth, which is for Alamoth, which is hard to work out what that means. Uh, Spurgeon reckons it means, with some good precedent for saying so, this was a song, Psalm 46 was a song set for female voices. Okay, so here is a song Spurgeon understands set for female voices. So if you've got a choir of voices, here was the women's part being taken up and particularly for young women and particularly for virgins in those days, young women, here it was set for their part. So here you have these women and what are they singing in Psalm 46? God is our refuge and strength. This is not the bass baritones booming out. Uh, God is our refuge and strength. This isn't the warriors of Israel booming out. God is our refuge and strength. This is the young women in Israel, their part which applies to all of us. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear. Therefore we will not fear even though the earth be removed, though its waters be troubled, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its mountains shake with swelling. All this is happening is picturing the very foundations of the world shaking and the mountains slipping into the, into the sea. He said even if everything goes upside down, God is our refuge and that would have been, I might suggest to you, a very wonderful song appropriately placed in the mouth of Naomi. God is my refuge. God is my strength. Even if the earth should change, even if I move from pagan Moab to, to this strange country of Israel and be incorporated amongst the people of God, God is huge in strength, therefore I will not fear. That's what I want to point to you to in essence. If you don't get anything else, Please remember that. Remember that psalm, those opening verses, that God is sufficient, that God's grace is sufficient and therefore what you need to do above everything else is to know God and to cultivate the, your relationship, your fellowship, your communion with the living God and cultivate friends who know and love that God and will be true friends to you. If God puts those things in place in your life, then you can sing Psalm 46.1 with great confidence. No matter what happens, God will prove your refuge and strength. Let's close in prayer.